quick maneuvering. Uh -huh. But it's important to get your commercial into that pod. I think, well, wait a minute again. If I have a strong show following, uh -huh. I'd just soon have in the last pod as the first pod. Uh -huh. Part of the first pod is always a carryover from the preceding show. Right, right. I, I, if I had I Love Lucy, I wouldn't mind being in the first thing anybody ever saw on the following show. That would be imperative. Once the minute plan of Pat took, uh, took, took hold, how do you get, now it's up to the networks to carry your shows. Although it's not your show anymore, you're only contributing to the show. Yeah. Um, who's lobbying the networks to, uh, it's really producers at this point, independent producers who are so well, who, pretty much out of your hands, we would say? Yes, whoever controls the show. Right. Why well, If MCA is packaging, MCA controls the show. So the business at some point changed where the agency work was dominated more by commercials than by producing TV shows. The media departments became more... Oh, absolutely. So my, my department disappeared. When was this, would you say? I would say it was 54, 55. Uh -huh. and that was when I was telling the guys, if you don't want to do commercials, go get work. In California, preferably. So, programming department was disappearing. Yes, there, you, in fact, there was no programming department after a while. Uh huh. Everything was commercial. Well, the media department was buying shows. Mm -hmm. By buying thirty seconds, it gradually also it shrunk from a minute to thirty seconds. When they found out you could be as effective in thirty seconds as you could be in a minute, just by tighten, tightening up your commercial, why were you paying for a minute? Right. What were you doing at this point? Well, how did your job personally change? Well, I I got bored. If I couldn't work seven days a week from eight till midnight, I didn't care. Uh -huh. So that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. And you missed programming shows. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, I, I'm sorry to jump about this, sorry. but uh, going back to commercials, um, what were the best kinds of commercials? What were the most effective commercials? Well, the most difficult time we had with commercials was finding out when they wore out. Mm -hmm. The rule was pretty simple if you could follow it, and they're violating it all over the place today. If a commercial is very clever, and has a funny line in it, it wears out rapidly. If the Procter & Gamble or the drug company type commercials are, which are informative and drab, they can go on as long as you want them to go. Proctor would always not try to say too much in a commercial. They would not try to be dramatic. No one ever, no one ever, ever won an award for writing a Proctor and Gamble commercial that I'm aware of. But they sold more merchandise than anybody else in their category. Why? Because they got to the essence of the argument. Say Crest toothpaste, for example, ADA supported, got rid of cavities, got rid of in children. They could demonstrate that. And other assets of that product that fought plaque or whatever it was, that's all you have to say to people. What do you have to make, why, why have to make them laugh? It's a serious problem. What was your research about the number of people who left the room when a commercial came up? During a spot, which was clearly a spot, two-thirds of the people were not really available to the commercial. They had either gone to the bathroom, they'd gone to make a snack for themselves, or they were reading, or they were playing cards. This is what they reported. And by the way, we had that research from day one in television. Mm -hmm. Day one, and it was why in our research. And never changed. Never changed. It never changed. We, we'd redo it every year and always come out the same. One third claim they were watching the commercial. But when they say they're watching the commercial, their attention factor could be wavering. They were there, and it was on. But they weren't really watching it. So we used to tell the copywriters to get an attention factor, like shoot off an atomic bomb them before the commercial comes on, and then say one line fast, and you know you can get that many people. So the idea was to figure out how to hook the people to get them to stay. Startle them. Right. Was that get their attention. Do there are a lot of ways to do it, but uh, if you do something that's strange and unusual and people kind of look and say, what are they doing that for? You'd probably get their attention, but you'll lose it fast if you're tricking them. Was humor a, a good way? Of no, that? it's a bad way. It wears out too fast. Uh -huh. But people remember the... Uh, remember the tagline. If you've got a funny situation, they can repeat the tagline after they've seen it twice. Right, right. And then it's not funny. 
Sometimes people like the commercials, but they forgot what the product was. You know. Oh, that's the worst part. I've I've heard copywriters say, "What do we care what the name of the product is? We're here to entertain them and win a prize." Uh -huh. That's what they were writing for. But that doesn't sell your product. Sure as hell doesn't. And so what you were saying about Procter & Gamble yeah. was that it didn't win any prize, but it sold the product. Name the product clearly. If you have to spell it, spell it. <laughs> By the way, you do know that Procter & Gamble was getting product names out of computers. Well, that's what I want. To, let's talk about research and what kind of research. Let's talk about what they called the product, which was the shampoo, Drek. Right. Drek. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what was on the shelves? Oops. Just to protect the label, they had it on the shelves in 30, oh, more, 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 three or four supermarkets. Uh -huh. Finally, an agency called Castor explained to them what Drek was. <laughs> <laughs> and Gail and I had a great time. We wrote commercials. Put, a, put some Drek on your hair and call yourself a curly. <laughs> <laughs> but now, didn't the computer spit out the name? Yes. And it's because it's so hard to find a name that isn't patented. How did they use research, the P and G or Y and R? How they use it? Yeah. How did they develop research? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of different kinds of research, as you know. Uh -huh. The uh, one of the most popular is when they get a group of typical housewives and they do them by by demographics. Working housewives, housewives come home after work. Uh, real real housewives who really do housework and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you find out what's your target audience, where are you getting your best purchases, and uh, you're addressing your commercial. It, it, may, it may be over-researched right now, because when you're using television, you get everybody. So if you don't get your target audience, you're going to get people you wouldn't have looked for anyway. They're all there. Whether you like it or not, they're all there. Didn't you feel that research was just a crutch? Didn't you tell me that once? Is well, it is a crutch for a brand manager mm -hmm. making big decisions. He doesn't know what to believe. And even bad, I've heard him tell the uh, research director of Procter & Gamble, I don't care whether the figures are good or bad, just give me something I can make a decision on. And so he could protect himself. Well, he, so he could have reason to do it, not his judgment alone. Did, um, did Procter & Gamble use uh, psychologists on staff? Not on staff. No. Well, I, I'm pretty sure most researchers had some psychological training mm -hmm. as part of their general knowledge. Right. But not specific. They didn't. They didn't have any uh, any wizards or anything else either. But there were products that would make, they knew how to make a housewife feel guilty, for instance. I mean, the, the message of the commercial was, you're not a good mother if you don't use our product, or, you know, or you're not a good housewife if you don't do this. I mean, there's that subtle message that goes into a lot of these commercials. Do you... Did you experience that? Or I don't that? agree with the philosophy, and I don't agree with also competitive advertising knocking another uh -huh. advertiser because you're giving them a, you're giving them a commercial free. But was it true that they do those no. kinds of things? No, no, no one ever intended that that I'm aware of. It wasn't done deliberately. You don't. They weren't sophisticated no. to do that. No, I didn't think it would work. Uh huh. It's but negative advertising. Um, you know, Vance Packard, I guess, in the Hidden Persuaders, writes a lot about that. You know. Yeah use that kind of persuasion on somebody. Um, Vince Becker was not a professional in advertising. Uh -huh. Or anything else he wrote in. Mm -hmm. But it was very important now to match, well we talked about Lucy and how you could have a very good show yes. and, and not sell a lot of products. Absolutely. And Lucy was and that's the, environment. Lucy was the real prime example of that. Yeah. yeah. When did you when did you realize the power of television? First day. Really? What we said was that if you invented something which had sight, sound, demonstration, and color, had the attention of the audience in their own living room, you couldn't do better than taking some money out of their pocket by stealing it like a pickpocket. Mm -hmm. it was, everything was laid out for you. Mm -hmm. There's no way you could lose if you handled it correctly. Remember, it was on the chart of the television presentation I made to all the advertisers. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, um, uh, were you ever under a pressure, particularly in the late 50s, to, again, the magazine plan, so maybe this is not relevant to you, uh, people were looking for more violent programming? Oh, no. I, I never encouraged that. Yeah. I still don't encourage it. Did you hear people being encouraged no. to do that? Well, when I was working for Warner Brothers, for example, those were not really violent shows. Right. And Western is never considered violent. It's considered a joke when they shoot at each other. Mm -hmm. 
that's a uh, that's a later development, a much later development. I think an unfortunate development. Mm -hmm. Well, there was certainly with the violence hearings in 1961. There was a lot of attention yeah. brought upon violence. Shows. Yeah. Do you remember those hearings? No, I, I I was not really interested in the subject. I, in fact, I'm very avid about the subject. I, uh -huh. I, I, to hell with to hell with car chases and guns. Right. When I see a, a lady and uh, who could, uh, totally incapable of defending herself with a gun as a leading lady doing that stuff, I, who the hell would believe that? Did, did you ever turn down a show because it was too violent? We never had in, in my day where when we were actively doing shows. We never, there were never not even dragnet or things like that were really violent. Right. They talked about violent things, but right. it was off stage. Right. But you never had. No. You retired. Fairly early from a regular job in 1961. Well, yeah, I haven't had honest work for quite a while. What I decided first, I didn't need the money. Uh -huh. and second, I was had a growing family, uh -huh. and I'd worked seven days a week too long. And I figured I'd only take things that either amuse me, or that might make me rich quick, uh -huh. but never spend more than six months on them, uh -huh. like closed circuit television. That's but you worked very hard. I mean, you. I, I, I did my duty. Uh -huh. Enormously hard. Were you unhappy with the, the direction of the business in 1961? No, I wasn't unhappy because I thought it was a, still an excellent television medium. It still uh -huh. is. Do you know, and you keep up with the business, how has the business changed now from the way, how is, are things done differently now? Oh, the way done? I'll tell you. In, in, in my time and for some time when I, when I got more general jobs of different natures to amuse myself, I found you could no longer count on buying a network time period and emerge successful because the network share of audience was shrinking from 90% to 50%. I think it will shrink further. Mm -hmm. And the choice of, to fill the gap was cable and there's no way I can figure out now how to write a good media plan where it involves cable because their ratings are so small. Right. You might say you get a big bargain in price, but you don't get a big bargain unless you audience. You try. You got to shake out cable first to find the match. Mm -hmm. Still, network is okay. Even if you get 12 percent, 20 percent would be excellent of a radio share of audience. Now, you still you still haven't filled a big gap. It's no longer like the good old days. You could buy three network minutes opposite each other and guaranteed a 90%. By the way, it scared us when we were finally computing how many commercial impressions were being made. I used to get up a chart and be saying, before I show you this chart, I'm going to apologize because it embarrasses me. But these are statistically correct. This show in a year makes 7 billion commercial impressions. Wow. Wow. I could prove it. But I, I, I said, you won't believe this. You really won't believe this, but this is a statistical fact. And even a loser would make that. A loser would say he's only got $5 billion? Big good. deal. Price would be different.